Hello, Minnesota DFL. I am so proud of you, and it is so great to be here with our Minnesota Democrats, and it is great to be home from Washington in a state in a state where our leaders want to invest in education and infrastructure and people and somehow still manage to have a $900 million surplus. That's what happens. That's what happens when you put Democrats in charge. Thank you, Governor Dayton, and thank you to our Democratic legislature. It is great to be home in a state that stands up for marriage equality and civil liberties and voting rights. That's what happens when you put Democrats in charge. And it's great to be home in a state that CNBC voted as the best state to do business in, better than Texas. Take that. I especially like when we scored better than Texas. Take that, Ted Cruz. That's when, what happens when you put Democrats in charge. And that, my fellow DFLers, is why we need to reelect Rick Nolan, Colin Peterson. You guys are amazing. Betty McCollum, who you're going to hear from shortly, Tim Walls, and of course, my congressman and the very per first person to support me in my first race for the United States Senate, Keith Ellison. And here's a great idea. How about we add Angie Craig to that list in the second congressional district? that we win the sixth and we add Terry Bonoff in the third. And don't forget our hardworking legislators and state leaders. Are you ready to make sure we keep the state Senate blue and win the state house? Well, you know what? It is all up to you. I know the hard work that you do because you've done it for me. You knock doors in the cold, you walk parades in the heat, you talk with family and friends and people at work, you bug perfect strangers to vote, you drive your neighbors to the polls. But you don't do this just so I'll stand up and say thank you. You don't do this because you're a huge fan of spending all day Saturday in a convention hall. You certainly don't do it because it's always fun or it's always easy. You do it because it's important. You do it for your kids and your grandkids and for the kids you will never even meet. You do it because you know the stakes could not be higher. DFLers, we are gathered today because our country's choice in November is a stark one. It is the difference between electing an outstanding Democratic president or putting someone in the highest office in the land who scams students with his Trump University, rooted for the housing crisis to add to his coffers, and was proud to call himself the king of debt. That's a quote. And for good reason. Donald Trump's economic plans would add more than $30 trillion to our country's debt in the next 20 years, he likes to boast, my friends, about everything he can afford to buy. Well, guess what? America can't afford to buy him. Or how about, how about this choice? We can have a leader who will continue President Obama's work to combat climate change, or a president who disagrees with 99% of the world's scientists and refuses to believe in climate change and in fact said it was made up by the Chinese. He said it. He put it on his Twitter account where he puts everything else. 
We can have a president with diplomatic and foreign policy experience or a president who wants to build a wall across the entire Canadian border. Oh, I forgot, that guy's in Wisconsin, he dropped out. Um, <laughs> But when it comes to foreign policy and Donald Trump, do we want a president who threatens to destroy our NATO alliance, talks about adding nuclear weapons in Saudi Arabia, and praises tyrants like Putin while dissing our allies like Germany and Mexico? No, we do not, because America can't afford that guy. We can have a president who will pass something that Al and I have worked on for years, and that is comprehensive immigration reform. <laughs> or we can have a president who believes children who are born in our country should simply be uprooted and sent away. You tell that, dear fellows, to the 99-year-old Minnesota World War II vet I met a few years ago. He was brought to this country from Mexico as a five-year-old, didn't know he was undocumented, served up to si signed up to serve in our armed forces, ended up going to Canada for one day to become legal, and served bravely under General MacArthur in the Pacific. My fellow Democrats, are we going to let Donald Trump Tell vets like that we don't need them and wish they would go away? I don't think so. This election, this election is up to you. The control of the legislature is up to you. And we know we can do this because we have done big things before. In 2006, you elected the first woman to represent the state of Minnesota in the United States Senate. That was me. You did that. In 2012, it was all of you who said we're going to appeal to the greater good and in the face of tougher than tough polls and against all odds, we became the first state in the country to defeat the gay marriage ban and the divisive voter suppression amendment. You did that. And in 2014, in one of the toughest national election cycles for Democrats across the country, in a year when it seemed like every state turned red, we chose a different path. We elected your friend and mine, Senator Al Franken, who, according to Chuck Todd, ran the best campaign in the country. You did that. Well, guess what, Minnesota Democrats? Our families, America's families, are counting on us once again to fight for what's right. At a time when people are worn down by the gridlock and the hate talk and are tired of being nickeled and dimed and every time they want to move ahead as the wealthier get wealthy and the middle class shrinks as the special interests run roughshod over our politics, it is time to tell the Republicans who are blocking progress in Washington that it is time to give the people of America their government back. This, this election isn't just about the presidency. It's about taking back the House and the Senate. It's about electing policymakers across our state and throughout our country who stand for progress, who won't hold us back. So giving people their government back means telling the Republicans that if you work hard in America, you should have a fair shot. You should be able to succeed. You should be able to send your kid to college. You should be able to save up and buy a house. You should be able to make it in America. A few months back, I met with a student named Chelsea from Marshall. She was raised by a single mom. She's as smart as can be. She's working three jobs. She wants to be a teacher, but she's going to graduate with over $40,000 in student loan debt. Democrats, we need to put the dream of a quality, affordable college education back within reach. We need to pass. We need to pass 
Elizabeth Warren's bill to allow Minnesotans to refinance their student loans and President Obama's plan to pass free community college. That's how we give that young girl her government back. Or how about the retired farmer in Albert Lee struggling to pay for his heart medication? He knows he could get a better deal if Medicare was allowed to negotiate prescription drug prices or if we could bring those drugs in from Canada. We need to pass my bills to allow that to happen. That's how we tell the Republicans we want our government back. I think of that suburban second grade teacher, divorced, working until she's 70 to save enough for retirement, but still buying those school supplies out of her own pocket. That was my mom. And in her memory, for all those teachers, we need to tell Donald Trump that his finger pointing and blaming and hateful rhetoric is the opposite of what our hardworking teachers tell our kids every day in the classroom. Treat people you disagree with. Treat people you disagree with with respect, be civil. Those are the values of our democracy. And Democrats, our candidates believe that the American people need a raise. We need to increase the federal minimum wage and provide paid family and medical leave by passing the Healthy Families Act. Giving people their government back means building roads and bridges and locks and dams and rail that work for this century, not the last one. When we invest in a new airport terminal in Duluth, that's jobs. Or a nat natural bus gas transit system, that's jobs. What we're really investing in is our people. DFLers, we need to fight steel dumping and protect our workers on the Iron Range. labor strong and uphold the fundamental right of our workers to organize. And here is And here is another fundamental right, the right to vote. We need to amend the Voting Rights Act and pass my bill with Congressman Ellison to require all states to offer same-day voter registration. And while we're at it, Democrats, let's overturn Citizens United and get the big outside dark money out of our political campaigns. You know, I think you know it's all one of my top priorities to work across the aisle and find common ground. I do it every day. But when it comes to the fundamental workings of our democracy, we must stand our ground. So let's take the government back from the Republican Senate that has dissed the Constitution and history and denied President Obama's pick for the Supreme Court a hearing and a vote. He deserves a hearing. In fact, since the Judiciary Committee began holding hearings in 1916, every nominee has had a hearing, except for 10 of them. They all got confirmed in 11 days. Judge Merrick Garland deserves a hearing, and he deserves a vote. But some of the people who have a little more age on them out there, you might remember that old TV show, Eight is Enough, right? It might be a sitcom, but it's not one bit funny. Eight is not enough when it comes to the Supreme Court of the United States of America. 
So what will it take to accomplish all of this? It will take unity. I see Bernie supporters out there. I see Hillary supporters out there. You all know I'm supporting Hillary. But what I believe... What the governor... Okay, okay. Okay. What the governor made the case about what matters, what matters at the end of the day, what matters in November is unity. And I am so proud of this convention today. I am so proud of all of you. Of course, you have your differences, but we understand in the end, we have one job, and that is to make sure that Donald Trump is not the next president of the United States. Now, I have one. I have one last thing I want to leave you with. In addition to all this work you're going to do in the next six months, I ask you to do one more thing. As you know, we are witnessing the waging of a frontal political assault on immigrants, on refugees, on people that look different. And it isn't always easy to stand up for that, even some of you, to stand up to it when you see things on Facebook, to stand up to it when you see someone say something at your work. Well, you have to do it. And you also have to find people that you may not agree with on everything and find them and stand with them to fight against this frontal assault. There are business leaders that agree with us on this. There are religious leaders that agree. And there are even a number of Republicans that agree that these tactics are bad. I leave you with this story. A few weeks ago, I was visiting with people in a mosque in Minneapolis. And I heard the story of a family, a mom, a dad, two kids. They went out to dinner. And they were just having their dinner, and a guy walks by, and he says, you four go home. Go back to where you came from. And this little girl looks at her mom and said, Mom, you said we could go out to dinner tonight. I don't want to go home to eat. I want to go out to dinner. Those, my friends, are the innocent words of a child. Why did she say this? because she knows no other home. Minnesota is her home. America is her home. My, Minnesota Democrats stay standing because we need to stand up for that girl, and we will never sit down, and we will stand up for the workers of this country, and we will stand up for the people of this country. We will stand up for America. We will stand tall. We will be proud, and that is how we will win. Thank you, everyone.